The modern Western world usually considers itself to have a shared history. This thing that we collectively call Western civilization, based in part upon a common historical heritage stemming from Greece and Rome. These two civilizations, however, were not the only ones in existence in classical antiquity. There were many others, including some that don't quite fit into the modern schema of Western civilization, however it's defined. And the same went for the Greeks and Romans in the classical world. How should cultures and civilizations that are not quite you, so to put it, be interpreted and understood? Among all of those other civilizations that the Greeks and the Romans came into contact with, Carthage is arguably the greatest example of the other in the classical Mediterranean. And peoples from the Greeks and Romans themselves down to the present day have never really known what to do with it. In part, it's because actually studying Carthage in any manner is remarkably difficult. And in part, it's because the textual record makes Carthage seem like such an alien culture, something reinforced by apparent mentions in surviving sources of a rather grisly Carthaginian religious practice, child sacrifice. But did this really happen? And if the Carthaginians did sacrifice children, how common was it? What did it look like? And who was chosen as the sacrificial victim? So, in this video, I want to take a look at this apparent religious practice, but before we get to that, I think it would be a good idea to take a minute and just briefly talk about why studying ancient Carthage, and then by extension the subject of child sacrifice in Carthaginian religion, is, and remains, and arguably always will be, incredibly difficult. And for this, I am drawing heavily on Nathan Pilkington's recent doctoral thesis on the same subject, An Archaeological History of Carthaginian Imperialism, published in 2013. When examining ancient Carthage, there are three major types of evidence that we can draw upon. Textual sources, epigraphy, and archaeology. However, in doing that, we have a very serious issue. There is no continuous narrative history of Carthaginian civilizations surviving from classical antiquity. What we have, instead, are several Greco-Roman texts which either mention Carthage a little bit, or reference other lost texts in even shorter discussions of the subject. And in that regard, it would be sort of like trying to glean a lot of understanding from a single footnote. It's something that's not really possible to do. These textual sources range from the writings of Herodotus and Thucydides to Virgil to Appian, just to name a few. And many of these writers, like Appian, lived during the 2nd century AD, three to four hundred years after the final destruction of Carthage in 146 BC, while some others like Herodotus were in fact contemporaneous. In no way are any of these sources very detailed. The most continuous history that we have, Justin's Epitome of Trogus, is a 3rd century AD work which abridges a 1st century BC work written by Pompeius Trogus. And in Justin's text, the portion about Carthage would fill about three modern 8.5 by 11 inch sheets of paper, taking into account the space of margins and the spacing between the lines in modern printing. So the point is that for textual evidence we have extremely little. And beyond that, it's all from Greek and Roman perspectives, which saw Carthage as the great other, the culture that was the opposite of their own, and thus they're filled with anti-Carthaginian attitudes. So. How to sift between what's real and what's a stereotype or an outright lie is an issue that needs to be kept in mind. When it comes to epigraphy, we have only 6,000 lines or so written in Punic, the language of the Carthaginians, that mention the city or its empire, and the epigraphy comes down to us in varying states of preservation. Sometimes specialists can barely read it. It's not all located in one spot, either. It's spread around the former territory of the Carthaginian state. And lastly, the archaeology brings problems of its own. We do know that Carthage had an empire, and we do know that Carthage established colonies. But when that empire formed or started to be formed, and when those colonies began to be established, is extremely unclear, because aside from one site, Krokoan, nothing has been fully excavated and efforts have instead been focused on the necropolis of each colony, or in the case of Carthage itself, on three sites the harbor, the walls, and the cemetery, where children were apparently sacrificed and burned. There are three major dates proposed for the start of the Carthaginian Empire. 650 BC, 550 BC, or 480 BC. 
None of these dates really come from archaeological evidence. Instead, we have events and people listed in Greco-Roman texts dating to the 300s and the 200s BC, and the archaeological evidence from the 600s, the 500s, and the 400s is often taken and matched up to these other sources. The problem is that none of this is clear, and if you were to remove the textual sources entirely, excepting something like Polybius' description of the first treaty signed between Carthage and Rome in 509 BC, and which he apparently found in a temple archive in the 2nd century BC, which we have no reason to really disbelieve. If you remove the textual evidence besides that, then the archaeology gives an extremely different picture. There is no indication of Carthaginian expansion in Sardinia or Sicily prior to about 410 BC, despite a textual account of a Carthaginian conquest of Sardinia in the 500s. And the infrastructure required for a maritime trading empire based in the western Mediterranean, as Carthage was, does not show up archaeologically until about 350 BC. What we find archaeologically instead is steady expansion and control in North Africa over the 6th century, but it's something that indicates strong local hegemony rather than anything grander. So why would this have occurred? The argument put forth by scholars who focus on Carthage is that Carthaginian hegemony over North Africa gets its start due to the rise of the Athenian Empire. Essentially, the volume of trade increased, and Carthage was exporting more and more agricultural product, which would have meant that a greater amount of land was required for growing crops. It's around this time that the first known colony, Kirkoan, was established, and the conquest of Cape Bon and the surrounding areas quickly followed. But we don't have material evidence for much else until really the middle of the 4th century at the earliest, in terms of something that could really be understood as an empire. The overall point I'm trying to raise here is that not only is the textual evidence from a non-Carthaginian point of view, but the material evidence itself is pretty sparse, and it does not match up necessarily with what the documents say, unless you either shift dates, force the connection, or ignore the text entirely, depending on what it is you're looking at in the archaeology. All of this needs to be borne in mind when examining Carthaginian child sacrifice, which we're now going to turn to. Our major textual source for this is Justin's Epitome of Trogus, and in this particular text, Justin generally takes military defeats or stalemates, and rather than explaining them in military or logistical or political terms, he explains the defeats in moral terms. This is where child sacrifice comes into play, because Justin, in shortening and actively selecting Trogus's original work, preserves the following account of a Carthaginian defeat. While the bravery of its inhabitants made it famous in war, it was internally disturbed with various troubles arising from civil differences. Being afflicted, among other calamities, with a pestilence, they adopted a cruel religious ceremony, an execrable abomination, as a remedy for it. For the immolated human beings as victims, and brought children, whose age excites pity even in enemies, to the altars, entreating favor of the gods by shedding the blood of those for whose life the gods are generally wont to be entreated. In consequence of the gods, therefore, being rendered adverse by such atrocities, after they had long fought unsuccessfully in Sicily, and had transferred the war into Sardinia, they were defeated in a great battle with the loss of the greater part of their army, a disaster for which they sentenced their general Malchus, under whose conduct they had both conquered Sicily and achieved great exploits against the Africans, to remain in exile with the portion of his army that survived. End quote. Later on, when they change their religious customs, they start to win on the battlefield once more. And oftentimes, this account is mixed with other textual sources and archaeological evidence to try and construct some sort of coherent picture of Carthaginian expansion. But it has left some people wondering over the years if maybe there is something more to this story of child sacrifice. After all, it shows up in the Old Testament, for example, and we know that the Carthaginians were themselves Phoenician, and the Phoenicians were in the area where the Old Testament was written, so did this really happen? Well, this is where the picture starts to become very interesting, because from one perspective, it looks like, yes, actually, it probably did, because a burial ground full of infants was discovered in Carthage in the 1920s. We know it as the Tophet. As the story goes, Francois Ricard and Paul Gilly, 
two minor officials in the French colonial empire who were stationed in Tunisia, had growing suspicions about a Tunisian merchant who was continually acquiring and selling Punic artifacts. And one day they found him with a rather fine piece of stonework, depicting a priest who had one arm raised in supplication to some unknown god, while tucked into the other arm was a baby swaddled in cloth. This particular artifact bore the letters MLK, or Mulk as it's normally pronounced. Their suspicions aroused, and apparently being tipped off about where the merchant was getting this stuff, they followed him one night and they stumbled upon the man digging in a field near the famous harbor. And, after convincing the owner of the land that there was probably something here, the two men were allowed to start digging themselves, and as they did so, they started finding not only little statues and votive offerings, but urns filled with the remains of infant, most of whom were charred. So what exactly had the two of them stumbled upon? Is this really evidence of child sacrifice? Well, specialists are, broadly speaking, divided on the subject. Most either say yes or no, with some few taking the position that, due to the problems inherent in studying Carthage that I've gone over earlier in this video, it's difficult to really draw a conclusion either way. The proper name for this site is the Tophet of Salambo, the word Tophet coming from a Hebrew term meaning place of burning, and this is connected with the term Mulk that showed up on the figurine that initially attracted the attention of the French officials. This word is also translated and pronounced as Molek and as Moloch, and due to changes in the Hebrew language and the translation of the Old Testament into well, Greek and other languages that don't have the same structure as Hebrew, and the lack of a similar term in Near Eastern languages from the period during which the Old Testament was written, it's not entirely certain what this term means. It shows up eight times in the Old Testament, five in Leviticus, once in the first book of Kings, once in the second book of Kings, and once in Jeremiah, along with potentially one or two other instances in which there is maybe a mistranslation, so based on that, there are two major scholarly positions. All of these passages deal with child sacrifice, or what looks like child sacrifice, and it involves fire, burning, and giving the children to Moloch. And each time that this is mentioned in the Old Testament, it is condemned. So the older view, prominent during the 19th and early 20th centuries, was that this is a human sacrifice to a deity named Moloch and that this was probably done by burning the sacrificial victim while they were alive. Hence the phrase in chapter 23, verse 10 of the Book of Kings, describing sons and daughters passing through fire as an offering to Moloch. But this whole idea of Moloch as a god has been challenged since the 1930s, with pushback against this revisionism coming at least in the 1980s, because if this was a Near Eastern god, then it's not mentioned in other cultures from the region during the time period, or at least it doesn't appear to be mentioned, which has led to the second position, that this was not a god, but a specific type of sacrifice. In Carthage, the two most prominent gods were Baal Haman and Tanit. We do know the meaning of Baal. It translates to master or lord, but Haman is not certain. Specialists think that, based on the context, it means something like lord or master of the furnaces, because it appears to come from the Phoenician root word for burning. Of course, there are other arguments that it does not mean Lord of the Furnaces, but instead something like Lord of the Altar. But Lord of the Furnaces certainly sounds like it's a god that has something to do possibly with human sacrifice, and which is connected to similar gods and practices from Phoenicia. But the degree of that connection, or if it's connected at all, is not that clear. To date, there is one Tophet that has actually been confirmed as being a Tophet found in the Levant. So, if this was an ancient Near Eastern practice, it appears to have been rare, and it appears to have died out by the 7th century BC. In other words, by the time Carthage began to rise. In the ancient Near East, however, gods were often known by their titles, so it's speculated that perhaps practices associated with Moloch sacrifices were brought to Carthage by others who eventually settled there, hence the other name of Baal Haman, Moloch Baal. But we don't have any way to really prove that, due to the paucity of evidence we have to work with. What we do have is the text of Justin which I brought up earlier in this video, and which does mention child sacrifice, as well as some other passages in Greco-Roman texts which claim that the Carthaginians did in fact practice child sacrifice. This is where we come to the second position, that basically, no, 
this is all nonsense designed to make the Carthaginians seem like alien barbarian peoples, because Greek and Roman religion typically did not do this type of thing, so of course the other civilization in the Mediterranean did. That's all well and good, but what about the physical evidence discovered in Carthage itself? How does that factor into play? We actually do have the age ranges for the infants buried here, although some of those numbers are approximate due to their remains being burned. 124 are prenatal. 79 died at birth. 87 died slightly after birth, perhaps a week or two. 60 died after two months. 68 at three to four months. 42 at five to six months. 19 at seven to eight months. 21 at nine to 10 months. 11 at 11 to 12 months, 12 between 1 and 2 years, 9 between 3 and 4 years, and 8 at 5 to 6 years. A significant portion of these individuals are, it's been argued, evidence of miscarriages or early deaths, and they do accord with the expected levels and patterns of infant mortality in the ancient world. The archaeology informs us that the Tophet was used in three phases. Phase number one lasted from about 730 BC to about 600 BC, and this layer is filled with increasingly elaborate votive offerings. The other two phases sort of overlap, running from about 600 BC to 146 BC, when the city was destroyed. And we increasingly see evidence of infant burials, and eventually toddlers, oftentimes with burn marks on the bones, but no cut marks or anything that would suggest killing with some sort of a blade. Those who suggest the child sacrifice did not occur point to the lack of children's burials in Carthaginian cemeteries, and then argue that this is what the function of the site actually was. The problem arises with how these remains are grouped. During the first phase, the vast majority of what was buried were votive offerings with some human remains and some animals. But during the second phase, during the 500s and the early 400s, broadly speaking, we start seeing premature babies being burned, but then, after the 400s, that shifts, and we see a drastic increase in first babies and then toddlers. Those bodies do not show any sort of sign of being unhealthy for the age, and they show no sign of deformity or any sort of indication that they would have died of natural causes. So this then perhaps does indicate that children were being sacrificed in a Moloch type of ritual whatever the specifics of that actually were. The description of this practice in Carthage is actually where the common image of Moloch that you'll come across if you Google it actually comes from. A large bronze demon-looking statue wreathed in flame, being fed children. Now why, if this is indeed what happened, would the Carthaginians have engaged in this practice? The answer is probably extreme distress. The argument essentially boils down to this. In the ancient Near East, human sacrifice was taboo, and there were ways around it, such as in the Old Testament when Abraham is about to sacrifice his son Isaac, and a ram then appears and is used instead. In much the same way, animals, or in the case of the Carthaginian Tophet, stillborn babies or miscarried babies were used in lieu of live humans. The movement from votive offerings, to the charred remains of miscarried children, to the charred remains of toddlers in the Tophet, suggest greater and greater social distress, perhaps because of horrific, costly conflicts, like the Punic Wars, radicalizing this particular aspect of Carthaginian religion, giving the gods the ultimate sacrifice out of desperation, as the military tide turned against them.